Good morning, everybody. I'm Andrew Powell at the Hypersomnia Foundation, and I'm delighted to be here today with Kelvin Tan, who is the Chief Medical Officer at Jazz Pharmaceuticals. Kelvin, you've got uh, quite an interesting background, and uh, I'd be um, intrigued to know how it was that you ended up at Jazz. Thank you, Andrew. Well, um, I've been in the pharmaceutical industry for about 20 years now. And uh, prior to that, um, I spent approximately 10 years in clinical medicine and academic research, focusing mainly in pediatrics. And it was after that time that I actually decided that I wanted to join the pharmaceutical industry. I was really curious about how the industry worked. And in particular, I really felt that I could impact more patients' lives by helping to bring them new medicines than I could by sitting in a clinic and seeing individual patients. And I remember the time when I first met the, the people from jazz and felt an instant connection. And that was really because it, it was very clear that this was a mission driven organization who was really focused on patients, having a patient centric approach to everything that they do and had a really strong culture about ensuring that everything that we do is for the benefit of patients. And so uh, that's how I found myself in jazz again about seven years ago. Now, at that time, as I uh, understand it, you were a very successful physician um, in what, what we would call private practice. Um, when you turned your back on that career path and, and decided to, uh, to go into the industry. Um, was there pressure from some of your peers or, or indeed from others in your life about whether this was uh, the, the right step for you to take? Well, actually, uh, Andrew, I was working in the health service. So that's the National Health Service in the UK, which uh, is a publicly funded organization. And there was certainly some raised eyebrows when I said that I was interested in moving into industry not just from my colleagues, but also from my parents who were probably a little bit exasperated that after five years of medical school and 10 years of clinical medicine and academia, I was deciding to change track. And yes, there are some, I believe, misperceptions of what the industry is like, but I was really struck by um, how rigorous the ethical as well as the regulatory standards are quite rightly in the pharmaceutical industry and actually the standards that we have to work to are actually very very high indeed so whilst there were some raised eyebrows I think actually it's been a really good move for me so no, no looking back. <laughs> I can uh, I can certainly um, echo from from my own background some some of that uh, some of that that feeling um, although I can't claim to have been a, a, a highly trained doctor and, and joined the industry <laughs> from, lawyer, from the legal right? profession. <laughs> but um, uh, now that you have uh, reached the top, and, and, and I hope that uh, e e even your parents would acknowledge that this was the case as Chief Medical Officer of Jazz, um, tell us a little about what that role entails and, and, and what your responsibilities are. Well, primarily the role of the Chief Medical Officer is to ensure that the voice of the patient is heard loud and clear at all stages of every piece of work that we do. And if you think about it from a drug development perspective, it's so important that we engage early and understand patients' needs. What is it that makes a difference to patients, their caregivers and their families? What are the endpoints, the things that they want us to measure in our clinical trials? But also we want to hear the voice of the patient when we're understanding how to design our trials as well as whether the trials are feasible. Would you put yourself through the rigors of a clinical trial? Um, we all understand that they can be quite difficult to um, engage in. And so at every aspect and every step of our drug development process, it's so important that we hear the voice of the patient. And I see my role as making sure that that is heard loud and clear in jazz pharmaceuticals, and it absolutely is. And, and as the, uh, the bridge between the patient and a tightly run organization that is, that is uh, dedicated to, to developing and, and, and making available new therapies and drugs, um, what are the 
areas in which you're you're active. I, I can see from your job description that there's there's some words that perhaps some of our listeners would would like to have demystified a little. You, you talk about global medical affairs, some global regulatory affairs, global pharmacovigilance. Um, what what do the, what do those terms actually mean in your daily life? Well, well, actually, th those are the names of the departments which I run as part of my role as a CMO, and they form the CMO office. And perhaps the easiest way to describe them is if you think again about how a medicine gets onto the market, it's the global regulatory affairs team that works with the health authorities to ensure that the quality of our medicines, the quality of our data, the clinical risk benefit is there. And they work with the health authorities to ensure that our medicines get approved. Then we have the global pharmacovigilance team and their role is to make sure that we are really understanding and monitoring the profile of our medicines when they're in the market. What you have to realize is clinical trials are really very small and it's only when you then um, make your medicines available to large numbers of patients that you start to understand in greater detail some of the other unknown perhaps benefits or even unknown risks of using medicines. And then we have the global medical affairs team and very simply that's a team whose role is to work with healthcare providers, to work with physicians, to work with patients and advocacy groups to help provide information in a fair, balanced, scientific and credible manner so that we provide the evidence and then at the end of the day, the physicians make the decisions about whether those medicines are right for the patients or not. So you can see how those three groups actually are naturally aligned and work together very well. So in, in this um, fairly, fairly complex role, you are, you're reconciling the, the inputs from these, um, these, these various sectors to make some important strategic decisions for, for, for Jazz around sort of where you invest your, your next research dollar, your next development dollar. Um, and, and so our listeners understand, you know, Jazz is a, is a, is a complex company. You are not exclusively um, focused on disorders of excessive sleepiness. But where do those disorders of excessive sleepiness feature in your um, global strategy, which I, I, I know understand uh, includes other um, neurological disorders as, as, as well as a, a significant oncology portfolio? Well, Jazz has a very deep history in sleep medicine, and it's a history we are very proud of. And so I would describe it as the sleep medicine, hypersomnia, excessive daytime sleepiness, working in that disease area is absolutely central it's foundational to who jazz is and it will continue to be as we continue to search for innovative um, exciting new medicines that we can bring to the market for this important disease area but we have extended our expertise into other areas as well including oncology hematology malignancies as well as neurosciences and some of the more recent areas that we've moved into include epilepsies movement disorders, and even PTSD. So it's important that we diversify and we find areas where we can help other patients. But I did want to reassure you that uh, Jazz is absolutely committed to the sleep medicine area. And it's something, an area that we're incredibly proud of our history, but also something we're very committed to for the future as well. And, and we see that commitment every day and, and, and share that great sense of achievement that I think you justifiably feel about uh, the, all the help that you've been in the, uh, in the area of sleep. Um, as you try to make these, these obviously difficult decisions, you're, you're, you're weighing some um, benefits against other benefits, um, how, how do you integrate the, the patient or the, the, you mentioned the patient's voice into your decision-making process? Well, it's really important to us that patients remain central to everything that we do. And one of the ways that we do that is by partnering with patient advocacy organizations just like your own. The Hypersomnia Foundation is very important to us because that's how we will continue to learn 
and ensure that we are supporting patients with the highest unmet needs. So the way I would describe it is, you know, it, this is a very much a partnership. We want to build long-term, sustainable, authentic relationships, partnerships with patient advocacy groups, just like the Hypersomnia Foundation. And I would hope that we would continue that partnership well into the future, Andrew. Well, we are certainly committed to, to, to the long term. Um, one of our challenges as, as we expand um, what we as a patient advocacy group do is, um, is reaching what we believe to be a very diverse patient population, um, but which when you look around the room at our meetings or, or you look at some of the, um, the, the demographics of, of the patient base in clinical trials that we've, we've um, been involved with to date, um, you don't quite see that diversity. Um, this is a challenge that, that you know, everybody is, is confronting, but I think you may have a particularly interesting perspective on that as the child of immigrant parents who has come through the, uh, the system in, in, in the UK and, and seen how the delivery of healthcare services can perhaps be improved in terms of its, uh, of its reach and its, um, and, and its accessibility to all populations. Andrew, I'm really pleased that you raised that point. It's so, imp it's so important for us to consider and to do something about. We, we probably all recognize just how complex the healthcare system can be and how hard it can be to navigate through that. And imagine how much harder it must be when you come from a population that's underserved or a minority population. I, I think it's really important that we raise awareness, that we consider, we think about how we need to address this inequity. I read some research just the other day, Andrew, and it was describing how even though uh, Black Americans make up 14% of the population of the USA, less than 3% are involved in clinical trials for cancer treatments. And it's a really stark figure because it just shows that when it comes to accessing medicines, even accessing medicines that are in development, there is a significant gap between ethnic minority groups, the underserved populations, and the general community that we live in. And it's something that I strongly believe that we can address groups like the Hypersomnia Foundation and Jazz together, industry as well, if we partner together and really put our minds and our hearts together to say, let's, let's fix this, let's solve this inequity. And, and one of our top priorities is to make some progress on, on, on solving that inequity. I, I, I can't say that we have the solution right now, but, um, but we are at least committed in the area of, uh, of, of awareness and, and education to making our message more accessible and to, to reaching a more diverse patient group. Um, as a patient advocacy organization, what else do you think we should be doing to enhance that industry partnership and, and do the most that we can to, to accelerate the development of, of, of new treatments as well as their availability? I think it's, it's speak loudly, um, make yourself heard, um, be a strong, equal partner, hold us accountable, educate us, make sure that we never lose sight of what's important. And I guess all of those things you could describe as being a strong partner. And it comes back to what I said before, we want to build strong partnerships that are sustainable, authentic, and credible. And that's something that I think we can do together. So probably do do exactly what you're doing Andrew keep doing more of the same well um doing more of the same is uh, is, is is always easy we will um, be committed to going above and beyond that with 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 your help and um you know, we've had uh, an, an excellent collaboration over the years and and I want to thank you and and Jazz for your support during that time um we wish you all the best in your future drug development endeavors, and we will obviously be following with great interest how that turns out. Thank so you. Uh, thank you for your time, Kelvin, and it's been, uh, it's been a pleasure to introduce you to our community. Thank you very much, and I, I hope you all have a great meeting, and I look forward to meeting you all very soon.